Hello, I know uh, I can hear we're on the hour because uh, I can hear a church clock outside my, my office window. So welcome to the Gobi webinar series. My name is David Johnson. I'm the coordinator of Gobi based in the UK and Gobi or the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative to give it its full title is a partnership uh, of um, scientific organizations uh, and Gobi Iki is its research arm funded by the German government for the period 2016 to 2021. The aim of this webinar series is to showcase and share the tools and materials that the six work, six work packages of um, this project have produced. Um, if you missed the first webinar on important marine mammal areas that took place on the 28th of October, you can find a recording on the Gobi website. Take a look, it's excellent value. Uh, today, uh, we're concentrating on migratory connectivity. Uh, and doing all the heavy, heavy lifting is my friend and colleague, Dr. Daniel Dunn. Daniel was formerly part of the Duke University MGEL team uh, who lead this work but has recently relocated to the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland in Australia. He specialises in empirical models using large species observations, as well as fisheries and uh, physical oceanographic data sets applied at a, a variety of scales. Uh, this can tell us a lot uh, about the dynamic and connected nature of the ocean and, and allows Daniel to combine biodiversity conservation, environmental management and geospatial science. After his presentation, uh, I will pose your questions. Please submit them via the Q&A or on chat um, so that then you can interact with uh, Daniel uh, and the points that he's made. So with no further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen uh, and pass over to Daniel to inform us about migratory connectivity in the ocean. Daniel, please. Daniel, I think you're still muted. I am, okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. Uh, what I was saying to myself here is that uh, I'm always a little bit worried uh, when David introduces me because uh, David and I have spent a little bit too much time together and uh, the, uh, his ability to introduce me could be uh, much more entertaining um, than the dry version of my research history. So thank you, David, for, for keeping it on the up and up. Um, I'm very excited to present to you today on the migratory connectivity in the ocean system. Uh, this is work that uh, has been going on for um, just about five years now under this uh, uh, um, grant from the International Climate Initiative through the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative. And it's, it's really exciting to be able to present where we're at with it at this point. So I want to point out two things before we begin. Uh, the first is that you feel, should feel free to ignore me entirely and just go to myco.eco slash system and check out the system itself uh, and play around with it. And please do uh, follow us at, at Explore Myco for um, lots of upcoming uh, uh, additions and new features to the, the system over the, the next year or, or so. Um, so with that, I also need to um, thank uh, over 100 people, which I'm not gonna try to do individually, but just to indicate that, that uh, MICO is a consortium. It's, it's led by Duke University and the University of Queensland, the researchers in both places, but really this is only possible through the, um, the engagement and the contributions and working together with uh, um, over 100 institutions and, con and contributors from, from many, many uh, different locations. Um, so we really um, appreciate that. And I'm just here today presenting on behalf of all of these folks. Uh, and I also need to indicate, as I just said, that this is uh, work that is largely done under this uh, grant from the International Climate Initiative to the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative. Um, but it's also been supported by UNEP WCMC and very recently by Global Fishing Watch and uh, through their partnership with Dalhousie uh, developing some tools. So we're really excited about the, the support that we've uh, received and what it has allowed us to do 
and what it will allow us to do. Okay, with that, um, today I want to talk about uh, migratory connectivity, obviously. Uh, and what is migratory connectivity, first of all? It's, it's the geographic linking of individuals and populations uh, throughout their migratory cycles. Um, and in this case, I'll just give you a quick example. This Cory Shearwater, we have uh, some um, breeding colonies off of uh, uh, West Africa and uh, Southwest, uh, Southwest Europe. Um, and they can migrate to um, several different locations. They can migrate up into the uh, um, Northwestern Atlantic or down off of um, Argentina and, and all the way over across the way to South Africa and even into the Indian Ocean. Um, and those different migratory paths take them, obviously uh, they encounter different sorts of uh, stressors as they go to the, these different locations. So uh, migratory connectivity is the geographic linking between that breeding area and the overwintering areas that they experience throughout their uh, migratory cycle. And in particular, we're looking at um, this in the marine realm, we're looking at uh, fish, sea turtles, seabirds, and, um, and marine mammals. Um, and the, the first question that comes up is sort of why, why are we interested in this? Uh, what, why is this important? And one of the reasons is, is that, as you can see, here are two examples of, of what this connectivity kind of looks like and means. And on the left, you have weak connectivity where you have a breeding location that can um, maybe that population goes to many different foraging areas. Uh, right, so one single breeding location um, and all of the animals from there uh, disperse to many different foraging locations. On the right, you have strong connectivity and that strong connectivity um, is exhibited by a single um, uh, breeding location really only going to a single uh, foraging location. And the difference between those things is, is pretty apparent, right? If you lose the single foraging location or if you have an impediment along the way to getting to that foraging location, you're, you're in trouble. That population is in a lot of trouble, or it's at least more at risk than it would be if they say had multiple foraging uh, locations that they went to, and also the genetic diversity that goes into using those multiple uh, areas. Um, so this is pretty, pretty important to, to uh, conservation of these um, populations. And as it turns out, a lot of these populations uh, are either near threatened or threatened under the IUCN, and including we're talking about 95% of albatrosses, 87% of assessed migratory sharks, 63% of sea turtle subpopulations. Um, so there's some pretty high numbers. Um, and this goes for, for uh, um, uh, target uh, fish stocks as well, where um, migratory fish stocks that use areas beyond national jurisdiction are overfished at a much higher rate than those within uh, one single or multiple national jurisdictions. Um, so we see that, that there's, there's some correlation there and there's some, some reason for that, the governance uh, issues um, and the types of threats that they might encounter uh, among many other, uh, many other reasons. So we, we want to try to get a handle on, on the information that we have that's available to us to, to provide this um, and improve the conservation status of, of these species. And it's not just uh, we, the sort of micro consortium that, uh, that I'm talking about when I say that. Uh, um, we uh, published a paper last year that specifically went to look to see what types of uh, policy uh, organizations um, in, in international marine policy were interested in this kind of information or could use this kind of information. And this is a completely non-exhaustive list, but just to give you a few, um, we've got the International Whaling Commission looking at the uh, um, uh, stock structure of different whale uh, populations, regional fishery management organizations, same thing, um, meta populations of of fish and how this type of information uh, affects their management of those fish stocks. Uh, the International Seabed Authority, uh, International Maritime Organization um, are both interested in, in thinking about how their activities or the activities of uh, um, deep sea miners or um, shipping companies might interact with some of these species. The biodiversity conventions like the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on Migratory Species are very interested in trying to um, pull this information together to try to provide uh, better detail about where these species are going and the important areas that they use, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, a, a variety of assessments and the sort of societal targets that we're developing and, and how they rely on this type of information um, to be able to understand how we're progressing towards those goals. Um, and I just want to break out one of those really quickly. Sorry, it's 10 p.m. here, so you'll see me sipping on some tea. So just one of those examples is the current negotiations for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. This is a, a new treaty 
um, for biodiversity over half of the planet. 47% of the, of the surface of the planet is in areas beyond national jurisdiction and oceans. And there, there are four parts to this uh, um, negotiation, and each one of those contains multiple parts within it that could be informed by this type of information, by, by un, a better understanding of migratory connectivity. And don't worry, I'm not going to go into each of those individually. That's uh, not the, the point here. Um, but just to give you an idea that, that each one of those entities in the last slide, there are multiple places within uh, their mandates where this type of information is really critical. Um, and that's, that's great. Uh, and what's also great is that we have tons of information about this. Since uh, 1990, for just 208 species, we did a quick uh, um, literature search and we found over 1,200 papers returned that might have some information about uh, marine migratory connectivity. Um, so you got the numbers over there on the right, but just vast numbers of papers published um, uh, that might include information about migratory um, connectivity. And specific to telemetry uh, um, tags, there are um, over 1,300 uh, papers or approximately 1,300 papers. So, so a lot of information about where these animals are going and how they're using various areas and connect various areas. Um, and that's great. And the types of information that you can pull uh, that, you, that you find in those papers are everything, again, this is that Corey Sherwater example that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and thank you to Maria Diaz and the authors here for uh, um, uh, all of the tagging that they've done on this, these populations and the wonderful work that we're seeing here. Uh, we can pull out everything from uh, the percentage of the population that, that goes to different places uh, um, uh, to overwinter, to the areas that they use when they go to those sites or when they're breeding, um, and, the, and the time periods in which they exit uh, or come back to um, the breeding area, the nesting area. Um, as well as the routes that they take, and down in the bottom right, um, you know, the, the areas that they use most along those, those routes. So there's just a ton of information in these papers. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we're kind of drowning in all of these papers, right? We've got over 12,000 papers on migratory connectivity for just these 200 species. You could do this, there's probably another 600, if not 800 species, that, um, marine migratory species that utilize areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, so you can imagine, this is just tons and tons and tons of papers. Um, and what it amounts to is that we have a, a bit of a, a knowledge transfer problem because we've got all of this information in papers, um, but that knowledge isn't necessarily making it uh, to the next step, to those policy arenas. So we know, we know what this problem is. I think many of us are, are, uh, have engaged in this and have been um, brought into international policy processes to try to provide information about what we know about some of these species and how they use the ocean. Um, and so we get on this sort of typical track where you know, we're collecting data, we're processing the data and analyzing the data, and we're publishing the paper with this important information about how these species use and connect the ocean. Um, and, and then there's this knowledge transfer gap. You know, we hope that those papers are, are read by um, policy organizations. Um, uh, and we probably, uh, if you're an applied scientist, you may engage in a couple of these policy arenas, but you, you can't possibly begin to engage in all of them. Um, so we have this, this problem of how you get that knowledge that you have, that you have in your head uh, as a scientist or that you've published about into these policy arenas. Um, and one way, um, it's, it's not just the policy arenas, it's also corporate needs for environmental impact assessments uh, to reduce their operational risk or in terms of thinking about uh, where to invest and, and site different uh, um, operations. Um, so we think about this, and, and, and one of the things that's been a huge um, movement over the last two decades or so is a, a movement towards more um, open access data. We want to contribute our data to repositories, and um, that is a, a, a big help, and, and, and we think that we're doing a great job when we contribute those data and make them available to everybody. Um, but we have a problem with that as well, because it's not just the knowledge, it's those data that are also ending up in places that aren't necessarily being used as much as uh, we would like them to be used. They frequently get used by scientists, um, but the number of industry uh, um, groups um, and policymakers that I've talked to that have engaged with the various um, uh, data repositories tends to be more limited. They tend to rely on scientists to go to those data repositories and pull the data and redevelop the knowledge that they need for their process. Um, so again, we're, we're sort of still running into this, this issue where 
um, uh, we think we're providing something, but it's hitting this, this knowledge gap and it isn't being used in the way that we want it to be used by the policy arenas. And that's not to diminish anything from, from these repositories. These repositories are absolutely critical uh, in the process of moving from data collection to knowledge delivery. Um, absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, but the thing is that, you know, when we ask for, sometimes if you're a policymaker and you're asking for water and, and what you're getting is, you know, the, the chemical makeup of, of water uh, and, and it's not useful. So this, this basic question of what is usable knowledge, what type of information is, is, uh, uh, can be internalized by policy processes and processes that companies are using. Um, and that's, that's a big question. And again, it amounts to this knowledge transfer problem. Um, so this is sort of what I was just getting at, that we've got this idea that data um, generates action, but, but we know um, from experience that that's not always the case. We have some very good examples of where uh, scientists are able to move data into action, but most frequently they run into obstacles due to budget, capacity, and, and time. Um, so it's really this interim product. It's, it's moving from data to knowledge and then sharing that knowledge um, with organizations that can act on it that is the sort of critical missing step. And I think one of the wonderful things about um, this Gobi Icky grant in general and, and the work packages that you're getting uh, webinars from is that a lot of them talk about the, the same thing. There's, there's a thing happening here and that, that thing is the sea change of starting to try to do a, a much better job of providing uh, knowledge rather than just um, providing data into repositories and trying to in, in, interact with one or two uh, policy arenas yourself. It's to develop these knowledge repositories. You heard it last time from the important marine mammal area folks. Uh, you'll hear it with uh, um, uh, folks from BirdLife International who, you know, I could probably be um, credited with starting this with important bird areas. Uh, and Marviva um, will also talk about the atlas that they've developed and, and which also sort of has this sort of aggregation of knowledge. Sorry, I'm not following the chat. So if uh, Vicky or David, if you want to just stop me, if there's something that I should be addressing, I would be happy to do so. I just see it pop up. So we know what the problem is, but we also know what the solution is, right? The solution is to take those, the, the data and the analyses and to bring them together in, uh, um, in syntheses that, uh, and formats that can be housed and provided to um, uh, policy arenas and uh, companies as usable knowledge. I think there's still a lot of question about what that usable knowledge is and a lot of work to be done on it, but I think we're, we're recognizing more and more um, that we need to move in this direction. And so that's really what, what MICO is. What MICO is trying to do is to try to be um, that bridging consortium to bring together knowledge about how marine migratory species uh, use and connect the ocean um, and, and provide that information to policy arenas and, and industry. Um, so that brings us to the meat of this, uh, this presentation, uh, which is the microsystem itself. And again, I encourage you to, to um, uh, drop in on myco.eco and take a look at the website itself and, and the system um, and investigate it for, for yourself. Um, there are really three pathways uh, to knowledge integration that um, we've been trying to utilize in, uh, to develop um, MICO. Um, and really only two of them have been implemented at this point in time. So it's a comprehensive literature review. It's taking a look at some of those 12,000 papers and trying to pull that information out of them, some sort of uh, almost like uh, data recovery or knowledge recovery from those papers, um, as well as developing uh, um, new integrated and synthetic products from original uh, data to put into the system. And then finally, um, we hope to be able to somewhere down the line uh, aggregate existing products um, from uh, projects or programs that are ongoing that have developed their own uh, standardized models and would like to be able to, for um, again, policy arenas or industry or anybody to have access to those standardized models. So I'm going to talk about those first two a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and the the background to this is that there there are a lot of different ways um, that we can sample uh, marine migratory populations to better understand how they use and connect the oceans. Uh, so we can um, throw tags on them, satellite telemetry, geolocator geo tags, marker capture, stable isotopes, acoustics, uh, or genetic sampling. And each one of those is going to tell us something about how areas are, or in some cases are not, um, connected. And 
we're going to focus here. The, the, this, the initial work on MICO has really been focused on, on satellite telemetry or geolocator um, uh, data or literature. And so we're going to focus on the literature review at the moment. So again, I showed you from the Corey Shearwater example some of the types of, of um, information that exist in these, in these papers. And this is just sort of another example of that, right? So um, the idea here is that you can look at these papers and, and begin to get a sense of how uh, the routes that these species are taking connect um, uh, various places. And that's all we're really trying to do with the literature review. We've got a massive um, data sheet uh, that uh, a lot of people have been uh, working on and filling in for over 1,200 papers to try to take these types of images and the information in the paper and begin to develop network models from them. Um, basically, uh, sites and, and then the routes between those, those sites or connections between, between sites based on telemetry or marker or capture mostly to date. Um, and so we're, we're taking that information and uh, we're trying to, each, each paper really is going to, gen, it has generated its own um, uh, network model. Uh, and, and so then you, then that's great, right? You, you, you can generate and get a sense of connectivity from a single paper, except for something like other act sea turtles. Uh, we have 96 papers, which generated 397 sites and 321 connections. And a lot of those papers are using the same data. Um, or they're uh, looking at the, the same, the turtles are going to the same area. Um, so there's an aggregation process that needs to happen so that we can move from these sites to, to nodes so or meta sites, these uh, sites made up of lots of sites, um, we'll just call them nodes. Uh, and so we took those 96 papers and you know, 300, nearly 400 sites and connections. And from that, we're able to sort of synthesize, aggregate 133 of these nodes and, um, and connections, 205 connections between them. And um, this is really, this is work that's just been ongoing over the last six months or so, once we uh, have wrapped up, once we wrapped up the literature review. Um, and it's largely, uh, this little part of it here has been largely funded by Proteus partners and EFWCMC um, to think about how we can start to integrate those individual network models and create synthesized network models from them. So I want to give you a taste of something that's not in the system right now, but that we're moving towards bringing into the system over the next six months or so. And that is, so what we have here are a whole bunch of nesting areas and movements between those nesting areas for those leatherback sea turtles in the Eastern Caribbean. And then from those nesting sites, there's you know, connectivity to the Northwest Atlantic, uh, in the Southeast as well, as well as uh, to the Northeast Atlantic. Um, and this is just for the North Atlantic. The, those same sites can go even uh, further south and there's connectivity across the South Atlantic as well. Um, so another example we've got, uh, um, if you look at humpback whales, and again, this is, this is only data that's pulled from literature that was published between 1990 and I think about 2016. So, and it's only for telemetry um, data. So there's a whole bunch of stuff missing in here, but it begins to get to give you a sense of what's possible and, and the total scope of what's out there um, that we could get if we can sort of bring it all together. Uh, so again, you've got um, some breeding areas uh, um, in the Caribbean and connectivity stemming from that, those breeding areas in the, in the Caribbean and same thing in the South Atlantic breeding areas on both sides of the South Atlantic heading down towards Antarctica. Um, and uh, one more final one, uh, Mako, uh, sharks and Mako sharks, um, again, seeing uh, large scale connectivity generated by these species. And one of the reasons I want to show you, I wanted to show you three different species uh, with these examples is, is that when we're talking about synthesizing this information right now, I'm showing you individual maps of individual species. At some point here, we're going to be able to start overlaying those aggregated sites to really begin to understand uh, what might be critical areas within these um, networks that are uh, across taxa. And that would sort of be the holy grail of, of places that we might want to um, look at uh, implementing um, management measures to help conserve some of these uh, um, threatened species. And so those are three examples from a couple of regions. The, the literature review that we've just completed uh, has over 200 species. I think about 80 of them will have enough um, uh, data pulled from literature to actually generate some of these network models. Um, and here is the full list of, of species uh, that we're, we've pulled data from. 
Um, and we're hoping to get this information up into the system, like I said, in, in about the next six months uh, and to complement um, the standardized models that are currently in the, in the system. Um, so what does it look like in the system? If we have time at the end, uh, I will uh, uh, attempt to just bring up the site and walk you through some of the site. Um, uh, but uh, I want to give you a taste of it beforehand. Um, so this is sort of what a network model might look like in the, or does look like in the system. It's a little more dynamic if you're looking at it uh, on, the, on the website. Um, but it provides you information about, in this case, connectivity for uh, ancient mirrorlets from the um, northeast Pacific up into the Bering Sea and across to the West Pacific and then back across to the um, uh, coast of uh, Canada again. So that we're trying, we're hoping this is actually a network model that was developed from um, telemetry data. And we're hoping to be able to integrate the um, network models that we're generating from the literature together with uh, network models that um, were generated from the telemetry data themselves, uh, as well as the other sampling methods that we've, we've talked about and mentioned. So underneath the, those um, network models, we're also talking about area use models. So that's the sort of second um, uh, method of, of trying to move from um, data to standardized uh, model outputs, which we think of as, as more knowledge about where, some, what, where a species is and how they're connecting regions. Um, so in this case, uh, in the background, you see the, the areas that the ancient murelet was using for uh, breeding in yellow and overwintering in, in blue. Um, and those network models, uh, those area use models are essentially kernel density estimates. They're a, a very commonly used um, model uh, uh, globally um, and uh, pretty easy to interpret. Um, generating them is another question. There are a lot of different sort of choices that you have to make along the line. Uh, and these are a few of the sort of um, different stages that we go through when we're trying to develop these standardized models. And um, this is a process that's ongoing. Uh, the methods you're welcome to look at, uh, they are on myco.eco slash methods. And we hope to have the, the scripts up in GitHub um, for anybody to take a look at and, and work with and, and help us improve. Um, again, sometime hopefully by um, uh, May or maybe, maybe a little bit after that. Um, so some key aspects of, of MICO uh, showed you some of the, the products that are being developed, um, but there's some underlying uh, uh, um, critically important ideas to, to convey about the system itself and why we're sort of able to do what we're doing at the moment. Um, and the first one is, is that we, we're not trying to disseminate data. Um, we talked about the data repositories before and the critical role that they play um, in, in the housing uh, data and making it accessible to everybody. Um, that's not a role that we're trying to play. We are trying to be complementary to those, uh, those data repositories and to um, observing systems and provide value added to the, to the data that um, they're working with. Uh, so that's the first one is that we're, we're not distributing data, but we are um, freely disseminating uh, um, uh, standardized summary products, those area use models and the network models. Um, so uh, everything that I mentioned so far, you, um, can or will be able to go to the website and download uh, for free to use as you would like. Um, by nature, these things are, are being designed to be modular so that we can incorporate new sampling methods or um, new animals for telemetry. If we get new tags, uh, new tagged animals, we can fit it in uh, to the area use models um, uh, and generate a new, um, a new standardized aggregate model uh, to provide out to policy arenas. Um, and this type of thing, um, the only way that MICA works, and we started with this in, in talking about MICA being a consortium, the only way that this works is if we can track the product use and provide value added, not just to those data repositories and to policymakers, but also to the contributors. And I hope to get a second here um, when we wrap up to, to show you the system and, and how it tracks product use and reports that back to uh, contributors. Um, it's really critical that we recognize the hard work of everybody out there collecting those data um, and the fact that we only have this knowledge because of the work that they've been doing. So hopefully we're doing that in as transparent a matter as possible, not just with the attribution, but also with the, the data that they have uh, provided in, in, in terms of um, uh, making it clear how much data goes into each model and the methods that were used to develop those models. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to take a second now and try to um, open up the website. So uh, bear with me while I stop sharing here and I will reshare in a second. Okay, David, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see uh, the microsystem front page? Yes, you're, you're showing loud and clear, thanks. Okay, thank you. So hopefully this, this works. So uh, this is a front page that's really just meant to sort of aggregate the, um, the information that uh, is in the system in general. Um, uh, we're looking for a lot of feedback on this. We'd like this to be as useful as possible to, as I said, policymakers, um, contributors, uh, and, and industry. Um, so it just has some general statistics and, and I'd love to um, continue work on this front page if folks have feedback on what types of information would be most useful to see on a very broad scale about what's inside the system. There are three ways to enter the system. Uh, one is by choosing a migratory species, uh, one is by choosing an EEZ, and one is by choosing a contributor. Uh, for today, I'm just going to show you what it looks like if we um, choose a species. So you click on that and it will hopefully open this up. Um, again, we're working with fish, marine mammals, seabirds, and sea turtles. Uh, I showed you the ancient murrelet example. Um, so uh, uh, we can go with that one. Um, and again, it has some broad descriptive statistics here in the front. I'm not gonna go through these because some of these are repeated in the mapper itself. And I would really like to show you the mapper. Okay, so this is the, the network model that I um, presented uh, in, the, in the slide deck. Again, it shows um, movement from this breeding node over here on the, uh, on the right, on the um, eastern side of the North Pacific, um, up to the Bering Sea, and then, as you can see, over to the West Pacific before coming back. If you, if you, if you hover over any of these nodes, it will tell you where the node is connected to. It will tell you the number of individuals that are moving uh, or that are in that node and the uh, activity in that node. And if you click on it, it will give you the area use model underneath. Whoop, and it's gonna zoom in for us. And it'll give you that area use model underneath that describes literally the area that was being used by those 37 individuals at that point in time. Um, okay, I'm gonna... The other thing that we're able to do with this is uh, that, uh, like I said, we're trying to be as transparent as possible about the information um, that was used to generate these models. So this, what I'm talking, I'm going to show now is specific to um, that activity, the breeding uh, area that I um, just popped up. And so the ancient murrelets in this case would have been in that breeding area from March to June. Uh, and it provides information about the populations, if we have that information. Um, that those uh, animals came from, those uh, birds came from, as well as the, the sex and the um, age of the animals. Um, and on top here, we also have uh, the years um, that uh, the tagging took place in and the number of animals uh, we have per year. So all of this was generated between 2014 and 2015 uh, and over 30 birds for each year. So I'm gonna click off of that. I'm just gonna turn these off for a second. Okay, so another aspect of this that I want to show you really quickly is um, if you click on uh, the contributors, so if, if I go over here to the, to the right and I click on, um, that's to improve symbology. This information one will get us to uh, information about um, who has contributed to the area use models. So those are all the area use models for uh, um, ancient murrelet, and you'll see here it says contributors. You click on that, and it will give you all of the data sets uh, with the contributors um, that provided those, those data. Um, if you click on, on any of these individuals, it will go to the contributor page for that individual. So in this case, I'm just going to pop up another page here uh, and highlight our good friend, uh, Professor Brendan Godley. Um, I figured he wouldn't mind, so I'm taking liberties here. 
Um, and it tells you about the number of data sets that he's contributed uh, and uh, the species that he's contributed data for. Um, and it sort of summarizes some of that information um, uh, about um, the data that's been contributed as well. Um, it also contains all the references that were given to us uh, by the contributor um, to, uh, that they would like associated with those data. Um, and at the bottom here, it shows the specific uh, products, these standardized models that um, MICO generated from those data or that those data have gone to, has contributed to. So you can look at each one of those and sort of and provide feedback to us about whether you agree with them uh, or, or not. Um, uh, and it also provides information about um, downloads of the, uh, uh, of the product. So in this case, um, these products have been downloaded. The areas have been, there are nine areas and they have been downloaded uh, 20, 20 times. Um, and uh, there would be further information if anybody um, wrote, uh, wrote what they were using the, um, the products for, then that would also be provided uh, to the individual contributor as well. Okay, so I'm gonna pop back out here. Slowing down. All right, I want to show you one more thing and then we'll, we'll go to uh, two final slides and, and questions. Um, so the other entrance that I want to highlight, we've talked about the, the migratory species and we've talked about the types of information you get when you look at contributor data. I also want to um, sort of indicate uh, what you, if you're um, a policymaker and you're more interested in saying, hey, for my particular country, what type of information do you have? Um, so let's just say Brazil. Uh, for example, um, you can look and specifically see what species that we currently have in the system uh, overlap the EEZ of that particular country. So that's one easy way of quickly understanding what information we have for, for various countries. Right now, this is specific to the area use models and not the, not the network models. Um, uh, so I'm gonna actually pop back into the mapper for a second. So in the main map here, um, you've got the menu on the right and the bird up here is just associated with whatever taxa you're currently looking at. But if you click on that, it will give you a list of taxa and you can choose um, uh, any particular taxa. And then you can go and click on um, the, that particular uh, species that you might like. Um, I wanna show this, this last element here because we have network models in the system at the moment that were developed from um, the literature review, but they haven't been aggregated yet. So what I mean by that is what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the raw data from the literature review. So we've had um, some feedback and we're, we're moving towards moving from these raw data uh, um, uh, network models, in this case for uh, um, common dolphin fish, uh, and we're moving from that to the, the aggregated versions of these network models. But right now, if you look, and you, uh, for some of these, you'll just see the raw data from the literature review rather than the aggregated one. Um, again, in the next six months, we should be able to um, uh, have the aggregated models up, and we will also continue to provide raw data from the literature review as we um, pull it into the system so that that information is made available as quickly as we can get it into the system, because it does sort of highlight connectivity that we're not able to show otherwise at this point in time. Okay, uh, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing this and we go back to the slide deck here really quickly. Okay, for two, two final slides here. Um, so the first one is uh, uh, next steps with this, with the system. What are we thinking about? How, where are we going from here? Um, I've emphasized a lot that uh, we're the main focus at this point in time is incorporating these network models from the literature review into the system. Um, right now we have about, I think maybe eight to 10 species where we have area use models and we've had those in the system for a little bit. Uh, we've been working on the literature review, really focusing on that because that's gonna move the system from um, having eight or 10 species to having 90 to 100 species in the system. So we're really hoping that over the next month you see uh, might go graduate from being a prototype to actually being a fully fledged system that can offer you um, information that's useful for your processes and, 
and your research. Um, along with that, the, there will be a download feature for the network models. Right now, you can't do, you can't download uh, the network models. Um, and and then once we get those network models into the system, we'll go back and focus more on generating more area use models. And we're really open to people indicating um, uh, species of interest to your particular processes or regions of interest uh, to help guide uh, um, us as we uh, look for data to pull into uh, the system um, and generate these standardized models from. from. Um, as I said, this is mostly focused on telemetry at the moment. So we're really looking forward over the next two years, really, uh, to moving out from telemetry and starting to bring in some of these other uh, sampling methods and trying to ge generate network models um, that incorporate more than one uh, um, sampling method. Uh, and also to really describe the uncertainty um, underneath uh, some of these models a little bit better than is in the system right now. Um, uh, uh, with regard to our research partners, we're very interested in collaborating on proposals to integrate data sets. Uh, um, we're at the point now where we're ready to do that. The system is is um, uh, prepared uh, and, and we are getting people in place um, to be able to start to integrate more and more data sets. So we'd really like to work with everybody um, to determine those next steps and collaborate on proposals and analyses of, the, of these data sets. Um, we've been talking a lot with industry partners over the, the last year, year and a half, um, trying to identify preferred product formats, what they can use in their processes. And we're really looking to start some pilot projects to integrate MICO into um, those, those processes like uh, environmental impact assessments or on the policy side into marine spatial planning. It's already happened a number of times on the, on the policy side uh, with regional seas organizations. Um, some of this information has been utilized in background documents, um, uh, data uh, documents for the International Seabed Authority um, and the Convention on Migratory Species. So it, it's happening and we're looking for more opportunities to, to pull, have these products pulled into um, those types of policy and industry processes. And then finally also working on um, co-developing proposals uh, with industry and, and policy arenas to make sure that those products um, can move as fluidly into their uh, processes as possible. Um, and then one final slide about uh, um, how you can join uh, us directly in the work that's happening uh, specifically at at University of Queensland and at, and at Duke. Uh, and the first thing I want to highlight is that a lot of the work on MICO has been undertaken by uh, uh, largely master's students. Um, so we've had everything from uh, an undergrad honor student to um, many master's students uh, to nine research staff uh, and, and many partner organizations working on this. So there's, there's, there's room for a lot of uh, different folks to, to engage with this. Um, and in particular, I'm hoping over the next six months that we will be hiring a postdoc for two years. So this is a little plug for anybody interested in doing this. We have a massive data set with massive possibilities, and we're really looking forward to, uh, um, to digging into it. Um, there are also PhD research scholarship opportunities at UQ and, and PA uh, scholarship opportunities at Duke, and we would encourage you to, to reach out to us and think about how you can use the system um, in, uh, to address your research uh, questions and interests um, as a PhD. And again, this has really been a uh, system has been developed um, uh, by a lot of um, uh, work by master's students. Um, and there's always more opportunities to generate models and case studies on implications for connectivity and governance of migratory species uh, for, for master's students. So please um, reach out to us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, contact us and let us know if, they're, if you're interested in this and, and how we can work together to sort of better provide this sort of usable, actionable knowledge, these standardized uh, data products or um, knowledge products to, um, to the world. Thank you very much. Daniel, great. Thank you very much indeed. We've got um, over 50 people on the call, so I'm sure there'll be uh, questions to, to answer. Um, before you do that, I noticed that one of those people on the call is Pat Halpin. Um, and I was just going to invite Pat. Uh, Pat, could you say a little bit about some of the challenges that, that this system has, uh, that has encountered, uh, particularly perhaps on the technical side? Thanks. Wow, a big question. Um, so I think Daniel's done a great job giving an overview on the system. The, 
biggest issue, I mean, to begin with, has kind of been going through phases of data entry, collection, how to, you know, take information from published papers, organize that, search it, turn that from raw data into information and then into knowledge. So the technical challenges have been evolving as we go through those steps. And um, now we're kind of facing um, actually more advanced and actually much more interesting challenges, I think, in terms of how do we develop network models? How do we actually go to this next level of, of more interesting and more in-depth knowledge? Um, you know, how do you take data that started out as, as many, many, many different collections, put them together into a sensible format, and then be able to gather out information on the importance of different areas, how to actually look at betweenness indices, how to look at why, why one, you know, one node in the network might be more important for um, conservation planning than another one. And so the challenges keep evolving. Um, there's, I could probably spend hours and Daniel could spend hours talking about the technical issues of how to actually build the system and maintain it. Um, but I think I'll just leave it there, but it, it's actually a, it's an evolving set of challenges going from the different phases of the project. And I think we're maturing quite a bit. So I think this is, this is actually getting to a new phase where we're able to move faster and acquire and assimilate data more quickly. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Please stay uh, on the line because uh, I hope that if uh, you and Daniel can field questions between you, that would be that would be great. And Daniel, well done. I, I think there was obviously more than tea in that mug. I'm really pleased that the, uh, mm. the, the website Definitely worked so, so well as well. Um, we've got a range of questions uh, that have come in. I'd like to start with Joe Appiot from CBD. Um, and Joe has raised two questions. Um, the first is really... Um, to deal with the HE targets that migratory species weren't highly visible in the HE targets um, and do you have any advice of how they might be better mm -hmm. included in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework um, and a second question from Joe uh, was that uh, the MICO system um, does it reflect shifts due to climate change or other factors um, and it could be interesting to see historical changes if that was possible yeah, great questions. Um, so uh, I agree about the um, role of migratory species and um, some might argue species in general in uh, the um, sustainable development goals as well as the uh, post 2020 biodiversity, uh, global biodiversity framework. Um, there has clearly been a lot of push, not just by individuals, but um, by intergovernmental organizations like the Convention on Migratory Species to include connectivity in general in the um, post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. Um, I think we in the marine realm have uh, um, a bit of a, a problem uh, because most of the time when we talk about connectivity and impediments to con connectivity um, that we think about on the terrestrial side, those impediments don't, don't exist. Connectivity doesn't work in the, in, in the same way in the marine realm. And so I think we also need to give separate uh, um, attention to the needs uh, for terrestrial connectivity and marine connectivity um, uh, in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, but in general, the attention that, that has been pushed on connectivity, I think, is, is very positive. Uh, and I was really happy to see those discussions happening, regardless of what, what, whether they get in or not. I think the, the, um, the increase in the level of attention that's being paid to it at, at the moment uh, is, is a very positive thing. Um, and I, I can also indicate that there is a IUCN uh, um, uh, connectivity conservation working group, um, which is a great forum for this, that it's also been pushing uh, this question um, in those arenas. And I would encourage anybody with, uh, with interest in, in that particular idea to contact them as well. Thanks, Daniel. I think Pat would like to add a, a comment as well. Pat? Um, yes, to uh, Joe's question on the IG targets, I think one issue that we should be considering is that most of the IG targets are area based. So, you know, 10%, 20% of ocean area in protection, things, things like that. And generally, if you were thinking about transportation networks, you wouldn't, the metric you would use to measure a transportation network is not the area of highway that you have. It's going to be the amount, uh, you know, numbers of people that travel 
the amount of merchandise that moves on that highway. So we, we we're really not using the right metrics to really look at connectivity. And I think that's a fundamental issue and it's one that's gonna be fairly hard to grapple with. So some area metrics can work, the nodes, you know, a, how much area of, you know, seabird feeding or breeding areas in the ocean, things like that may be area based, but there's other metrics we, we're gonna have to augment and I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge to move that from the science community into the policy arena. Thanks, Pat. Um, a question from Anna Adamo, and uh, thank you, Anna, very much indeed. She's been highly complimentary about uh, the way MICO looks and the fact that it's a useful tool. But she talks about um, the need uh, or recognition that updates are important. And do you think or plan to update MICO with other data and non-migratory species? Uh, do you plan to keep MICO for the next decades? And finally, uh, she'd like to contact you direct um, to have more details uh, and bring it up to the policy level. Daniel, please. Sure. Uh, yeah, great, great questions. Thank you very much for the, the question. Um, and um, the, the general answer about updates is, is yes, absolutely. Um, as I was trying to emphasize uh, what you see in the system now, I would, I would call largely a, a prototype, uh, is how I would describe the system at the moment. Um, it is not in, in no way exhaustive or comprehensive, even for specific populations. There are probably only one or two populations in it that I would call relatively comprehensive in terms of explaining the connectivity and the area use for those populations. So, but uh, as I said, this literature review, I feel is really moving us from this prototype into a fully fledged system that will have um, relatively comprehensive information with specific to a particular sampling method uh, for many species. Um, so we do expect to update it. I think we will have an update in the next six months that pulls in a number of those um, uh, uh, sort of uh, integrated network models. Uh, so please look for that and uh, we'll try to communicate it out to everybody uh, as much as possible. Um, and then in terms of sort of looking further down the line, um, we are uh, very excited to, to keep working on this. The, the laundry list of things that we want to do is very long. Um, and so I think, and, and currently we, we have a number of conversations going on um, that we hope will result, result in uh, consistent funding over the next um, uh, number of years. Uh, it's, it's always a battle with this kind of system. Um, and we're always looking to work with people to develop new proposals. And, and we're also looking way down the line at how this is gonna get funded in a more consistent manner once it is a fully fledged system. And, and looking at some of the examples that are out there, the really good examples of the um, integrated biodiversity assessment tool and some other tools of that nature, or things like OBIS and how OBIS has been um, incorporated into uh, um, uh, UNESCO uh, and thinking about various funding, very long-term funding mechanisms like that to be able to have this work in perpetuity um, well past me or Pat. Um, so very much looking forward to that and, and expecting updates and longevity. Thanks a lot. Maybe this next one is for Pat. Again, very complimentary about MICO. Um, but uh, a question about um, the fact that MICO is based on published literature uh, and whether there are, any, are there are any plans and ideas to look at data deficit areas like the Indian Ocean? Pat. I think Daniel could also go after this one um, vigorously. Um, one of the real outcomes of MICO is to identify knowledge gaps. It's to provide that transfer of knowledge. And in doing so, it really does highlight the areas that we, we just don't have raw data, we don't have the amount and density of data to actually create defensible positions and be able to characterize current situations. So I, I do think MICO can be used as, as directly as a tool to identify data gaps and to help set priorities. Um, there are ways that we can try to, you know, scientific, scientific communities can try to do a better job of extrapolating information to be able to model but at the end of the day, we really do need to fill these data gaps. There's just no way around it. So, um, but I think it, it will help highlight where are these critical areas like the Indian Ocean, other areas where we just have, um, have major knowledge gaps. If I could just add on to the end there, I 100% agree. I think 
we have we have always known that um, the this work is going to highlight knowledge in particular regions because that's where the studies have happened. <clears throat> and I think it our our sincere hope is that one of the benefits to researchers as well is to be able to show the importance of work in some of these regions that haven't been studied as well. Uh, so we're we're really hoping that th this can be used by um, both researchers and funding organizations to highlight, as Pat said, those areas that are, are um, uh, understudied. Thanks so much. I think I slightly shortchanged uh, Joe Appiot because I didn't give you a chance to answer about the shifts due to climate change uh, and whether perhaps sure. historical <coughs> could be retained. Perhaps a quick response. It's, it's all the yeah, it's all the tea in my mug. Apologies. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a, another great question that we get asked quite frequently. And um, the, the answer is we would love for, for the system to be able to, to work that way. But for the system to work that way, we need a time series. And right now, we don't even have a baseline. So this, it's, this is essentially the, what we're trying to go after to begin with, is just to aggregate this information so we have a baseline understanding of connectivity at this point in time. That being said, if you, you know, if you go into the system, as I was um, trying to show, it's very specific about uh, the um, years and months of the data, the telemetry data that has been pulled into the system. And it is developed in a modular manner such that uh, we have models for each animal. Um, and we can take those models and, and rejig them um, and come up with uh, standardized models for particular years. So at some point in the future, if we had not just data for ancient murelets from 2014 to 2015, but we had it from 2014, 2015, you know, all the way out to 2030, 2050, you know, if we had multiple intervals where we had this, these same types of data, then we could put those models together in a way that would be able to answer that question or at least answer it better. Um, but at the moment, uh, it's more of an effort to try to provide that initial baseline of, of what connectivity exists. Thanks, Daniel. We've got a great question from, from Louis. A large part of satellite tags are collecting depth and temperature along the individual track as data series or bin data. Are there any plans about incorporating how water masses feature change along these tracks and so as to model environmental characteristics in different used areas? That's a great question. Oh, Pat, do you want to jump in here? Sure, um, and I'll, let, I'll hand it back to you as well. So the <laughs> issue of biologging is one of the, you know, kind of associated data collection um, methods that has been targeted for a number of years to be able to use telemetry tracking data, not only to track animal behavior and migratory patterns, but also to track the underlying environment. I think there's a huge, huge opening here to really refine that. And I think that's one of the things on the, you know, MICO 2.0 agenda of how do we actually, you know, produce or it, look in more closely into those interfaces because the ability to um, use animals as samplers, sampling the environment, looking at the behavior, looking at how the animals are responding to the environmental conditions um, is, is an area that has quite a bit of, of, of progress to be made there. Daniel, I'll hand it back over to you. Sure. Um, the the short answer is is that we don't have any um, uh, expectations in the short term of including that type of information in in MICO. Um, there is unquestionable that that those that um, uh, biologging uh, from marine species is really really useful. Um, the RADID data set for Antarctica is a great example of of um, data from animals where we can't sample, where you know, um, we're, not, we're not able to get to sample in those places. So I think it's obviously very, very useful, but I think in this case, um, it would require a, a very different looking system um, than, than this one. Daniel and, and Pat, I've got two questions myself that I've been itching to ask. The first is really whether you mentioned migratory fish stocks and you showed us the 35 uh, fish species that you had covered within within the myco um, system to date i wondered whether you'd had any reaction from the rfmos about commercial 
confidence of fish data or or perhaps the the issues that sometimes come come up um, about uh, really identifying where these fish go um uh, no because uh, those models uh, first the, the network models from that literature review um this is the second time that they've been shown publicly uh so those are um you, you can see some of the the raw data on the website uh, but the, the sort of aggregated versions of them, um, they are, they are brand new. Uh, so we could, we could revisit this question in six to 12 months, uh, when they're in the system and, um, and maybe some folks from RFO get a chance to look at it. I don't, I don't think that, um, it should be a big issue because I don't think we're, we're, um, challenging any types of information. We're not using fisheries data. We're not using observer data. Uh, we're using information from published literature. So my hope would be that, um, one, they know this better than we do. Um, uh, that's both the hope and an expectation in terms of the stock structure of those fish stocks, um, uh, the spatial stock structure. Um, and if it can help them, um, that's great. Cool, thank you very much. Um, the other one's pr probably a bit easier. Um, uh, we had a great, um, webinar as I mentioned earlier from the important marine mammal colleagues uh, showing uh, and uh, Eric Hoyt and, and Giuseppe Nota Bartolo and uh, Simone uh, from Tethys um, showed us where uh, the immers are and I'm sure that colleagues from BirdLife will show us where the IBAs are as part of this project. Is there any way that this can be combined? Can we look at um, where the uh, myco, myco tracks uh, relate to the immers and the IBAs? Can we anticipate uh, for future workshops <laughs> of, of those work packages using myco? Um, yeah, so uh, one, I think this, we need to give a big shout out to, to Joe Appiat in the, in the CBD and the EBSA process and um, uh, Emgel and Pat and the folks at CSIRO who were the technical support teams for those EBSA workshops. And the reason that I say this is because I think that that process is what brought uh, a number of us together on the same types of problems. I think that process illuminated for the marine mammal community um, the gaps that were there relative to what bird life had. Um, so in those processes, we all looked at bird life and we all looked at the seabirds and said, you know, damn, <laughs> why, why don't we have this information uh, for other taxa? Why don't we have this information about how those places are connected? Uh, you know, we keep getting asked for this information and, and if anybody should be able to supply it, we should be able to supply it and, and we can. Um, and I think that process uh, sort of illustrated the type of effort where we can and should be pulling this information together uh, to better explain and underpin the importance of particular areas in the ocean. So I would say that's not only a possibility, it is the end goal. Brilliant. Um, Daniel, can I just ask you to unshare your screen? I think I'll try and draw this Ooh, to a sure. close now. Uh, thank you and thank you to Pat for uh, um, all, all the answers that you've given to the questions and, and the presentation itself. One of the things that um, impressed me was uh, the idea of, of uh, the, the level of transparency in, in the MyCo system and, and uh, ultimately I hope people will be clamoring because they want their information in MyCo, they want to see that they are, are the contributors. Um, I, I ought to say that uh, um, both the videos and the slides will be available on the Gobi website, that's gobi.org slash webinars. Um, so if you want to access that, that, that that's um, that's great. Um, and I also wanted to uh, do a good sales uh, pitch uh, to just highlight that uh, we've got, um, uh, when it works, we have four other uh, Gobi webinars scheduled um, between now and the end of January. Um, and a plug for the third of those that you can see on the screen there uh, will be um, from BirdLife, uh, presentations by Maria Diaz and Tammy Davis, uh, really highlighting 
the Gobi work and the work that BirdLife have, have done using the seabird tracking information um, and uh, some of the exciting um, um, propositions that have, have come from that. So I hope you'd be able to join that uh, on Thursday the 26th of November. Um, but for now, a big thank you to Daniel and to Pat um, and to my colleagues uh, uh, as well in um, uh, who have been recording this and, and following it. Um, I have one very last question from Louis, which I'll, I'll finish up with, uh, and that is, is there a way in which the contributors can load data from papers into MICO that could speed the data input and a paper a day keeps the doctor away? Hmm. Daniel. Um. <laughs> Yes, uh, there is not a way to load papers directly into the into the system. Um, we have uh, the the mechanism so far for data has largely been just uh, um, providing access to the data, largely putting it into a data repository, and then for us to go and and pull from the data repository. Though so it doesn't have to happen that way, we encourage that. But for papers themselves, um, the literature review was a systematic literature review, and and uh, so we had to be very specific with the papers that um, went into that uh, and that literature review will be published and should uh, be submitted uh, by May. Um, and, uh, but um, that, that constraint on us um, ended when the systematic literature review ended. So going forward, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question. I think if we can, if we can identify mechanisms to um, support uh, reviewing and getting that information into the system, then it potentially it's feasible for us to, to, to go that route. But at this point in time, um, it's, it's not feasible. But we highly encourage you just to contact us and, and we can talk through it. Wonderful. I think that's a great way to close out. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for listening, for contributing. Thank you to uh, Daniel and Pat. Um, stay well and please tune into the next one uh, if you have a chance and if you're interested. Many thanks. Thanks, David. Thanks to everybody who contributed.